special guest, and this is where I stop sharing my screen. Our first guest is Peter Jedeke. I first met Peter um, years ago when London Center hosted a general assembly at EGM. And uh, as a newbie, only about a year in a, as a member, I felt intimidated, but for a very, very short period because Peter has a, a very uh, charming personality and welcomes everyone, has this incredible sense of humor. He was raised in Southern Ontario. He studied at Western University in London and taught math and science at a community college until he retired uh, five years ago in 2017. He's been a RASC member since 1975. He has served as national president and is a fellow of the RASC. His life membership has paid uh, has been paid for many, many times over. And so Peter, uh, really welcome you to the center and we look forward to hearing about the history. What's up? Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. And um, welcome to everyone, both uh, Halifax Center members and some of the uh, other members that I see from across the country on my list here. What are we up to? Up to 29 participants already. That's really great. Uh, so, Judy, you're going to have to uh, enable screen sharing. Um, all right. I thought I had, but let's just, as a co-host... Try that. Yeah. Okay, right. okay there we go. Down That's the bottom of your screen, as we share screen. You should be okay. Yeah, that should do the trick. And how are we doing? Good. Full screen? Yep. All right, excellent. Well. So I, I did I did mess with the title a little bit. You know, of course, our logo is uh, Quo Ducat Urania. That's our motto, where Urania leads. And so Urania leads each of us as an individual. And so this is my uh, personal view of the history of the RSC. But of course, I, full, I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. You know, we've got a lot more going on <clears throat> that, than just an individual. So uh, I wanted to start at the very beginning. I, I don't really have too much to say about the first long while since, you know, I wanted to try and make this as personal as possible, but I think it's fair to take the history of our society and divide it into four general categories. I'll just call them phases just to make it sound scientific. And the first was uh, the opening and the, the club started in Toronto in 1868. So you notice we did have our 150th anniversary a few years ago. This this is what was being celebrated, the founding of the Toronto Astronomical Club. And they changed their name in 1884. And then in 1890, they, oh, they incorporated as a Canadian society. So the idea is that we could say that our, our structure as a Canadian group started in 1890, and we celebrated our 100th anniversary of that in 1990 at the General Assembly in Ottawa. The idea of what the society was like in those early years, um, you know, all I can imagine, of course, is that it wasn't like today. If you wanted some news, you had to write a letter. You had to rely on postal correspondence, which might have taken forever. Uh, anything you wanted to get, you know, you would have had to get through a delivery system like the post office, and couriers didn't exist. That, that didn't mean there was no sense of national uh, cohesiveness to the society. I just think it would have been a very difficult thing to do in those days. And, um, you know, there was basically just the club in Toronto. And if someone outside of Toronto felt like they were joining something that was in Toronto, I could sort of sympathize with that. But at the same time, of course, there were folks who were active. And, you know, if you read the histories, and read the journals and so on from those early days, you can get a sense of the activities that went on. Obviously, people didn't complain about light pollution as much as we do today. Uh, the telescopes that they had were either really, really expensive or they had to build them themselves. We still have amateur telescope makers today, but I think it was a different skill set back in those days. So I'm going to just arbitrarily switch over to a second phase, 
and say that when the society grant was granted its royal charter, we really became more of a society that I would recognize uh, and the folks my age, anybody, you know, the Dave Chapman and Stan Runge group uh, cohort in this in this club would recognize us. And we started with our uh, royal charter in 1903. And so we celebrated the 100th anniversary of that in 2003 at the Vancouver General Assembly. And then, of course, in terms of what we think of as the modern RASC, the idea of it being broken down into centers was critical. And the first of these centers was formed in Ottawa in 1906. But at that time, I don't think we, I mean, I've tried to read in between the lines of what things, what folks did back in those days. And I think there was a kind of a, uh, a, a sort of a look the other way attitude. If a local club did something, the national organization didn't really much care. Uh, and if the national organization ordered the clubs to do something, the clubs may or may not have, you know, kind of followed it. As long as certain forms and paperwork was filled out, kind of satisfied everyone. And that was basically all the clubs really consisted of anyway. But in any case, it kept on moving. There was a national council and gradually the centers became represented on the national council. At first, it was the presidents of the clubs that represented each club on national council. And uh, then, of course, things started to heat up as technology and our society became more uh, prosperous, we had more things to do and so on. We had uh, rented office space in downtown Toronto. There were a couple of different locations. And we even had a staff member part time, as far as I can tell, um, part time for the entire time period. Her name was Eva Budd, and she stayed with the society for, as you can see, uh, almost four decades. 1912 to 1948. And, you know, that's really, that kind of gives you a, a feeling already of how we in the RAC tend to treasure our, our longevity and our consistency and our traditions, of course. So one of the main things that they tried to do to offer a support to folks across the country was to have a library uh, with I items that could be sent out by postal correspondence and artifacts even, although I, I'm not really aware of how often something like slide, lantern slides, or maybe a telescope or some kind of a measuring device would be sent out that way. But in any case, I, I want to say that uh, from our point of view today, I think there was a, a lot of resistance to the younger generation. Youth were kind of told to sit in the back row sort of thing and, uh, you know, just pay attention quietly and learn from their elders. And that, that I think, characterized the second phase of the RASC. And as a good example, I'm going to talk about the London Centre a little bit, just because you all know I'm a London Centre member. The London Centre was founded in 1922, and we had a gentleman named uh, Harold Reynolds Kingston, who came to us from Winnipeg Centre. And when he came to London in 1919 or so, he pretty much immediately took an interest in astronomy. He was a professor of math at Western University. And so they uh, held a public meeting to promote astronomy and decided to form an astronomy club. And someone, I'm pretty sure it was Kingston himself, said that uh, it would be a good idea to, to join up with the RASC. And so the uh, London Astronomy Club applied to become a center and that um, application was approved on February the 24th, 1922. And what that means folks, is that this year is the centennial of the London Center. And I'll be quite honest, you know, Judy's invitation for me to talk about the history of the society, I was motivated to do that more or less as a tribute to the fact that this is the centennial London Center. So thing, a lot of things that we are accustomed to happen, you know, every center has similar backgrounds in this way. We had a public lecture event for the first time in 1923, and that was a celebration of our first anniversary. So here we are in London Center now, we're doing things to celebrate our 100th anniversary. And of course, one of the nice things about this aspect of the RAC is that you can plug into national resources and the national sense of community. So C.A. Chant, who of course is one of the most famous of the RASC members of the first uh, half of the 20th century, uh, he came to London and he had been on a trip to Western Australia to observe the total eclipse of the sun. And uh, so that was what he spoke about when he came to London. And he later of course was responsible for uh, arranging the construction of the David Dunlop Observatory, which is still Canada's largest optical telescope. All apologies to the folks out in Victoria 
who, uh, you know, the David Dunlop Observatory, I'm told, was deliberately built just that much so that the mirror was that much bigger than the one out in Victoria. Uh, and anyway, the, lo the local connection continues. We're still, we're having a great time looking up the history of our own observatory on the campus at Western U. And uh, we have certain reason that there were connections, let's say, between Professor Kingston and the local uh, move to start the Cronin Observatory and what happened at David Dunlop. That's a, that's a portrait of C. Chanty. You see there, that portrait is, is still there on the, at the, at the National, at the Society office. And it basically has been there forever. I'm not sure when it was painted, but I remember seeing it first time I was there back in the 1970s. So in those days, the RASC was characterized by professional academics. Uh, in other words, research astronomers who thought of the RASC either as a chore or as part of their uh, responsibility as being astronomers in the astronomy community. And the RASC was really the only national organization. And so it did have a kind of a professional component. In fact, I was kind of impressed even just yesterday evening uh, I was onlining with the Tucson Amateur Astronomers and um, a, a postdoc at University of Arizona gave a talk about uh, observing uh, exoplanets. And he actually showed the title of a paper by, uh, by, that was published in JRASC in 1933. So, you know, we, we did have a, a role to play in that, in that area back in, in the second phase of the RAC's history. Another thing that I, I find kind of interesting is that back in the 30s and 40s, for quite a few terms, the uh, honorary president of the society was the Minister of Education for the province of Ontario. And I think probably that was because the Ministry of Education did give an annual grant to help uh, with the administrative costs of running the society in downtown Toronto. So anyway, of course, from our perspective, as folks who are active in the National Society, the second phase, maybe the most important thing happened in the second phase was that uh, National Council became a sort of a separate body from just center presidents. And you see here a meeting of National Council in 1958, Helen Sawyer-Hogg, who uh, probably next to C.A. Chant is probably the best known of our past uh, presidents and astronomers, obviously Toronto-centric. She spent her career working at the University of Toronto and she studied my favorite topic, lobby or clusters. So uh, I had the privilege of meeting Helen Hogg on two or three occasions. She was definitely, uh, you know, uh, a, a person that you you looked up to, no matter how much taller you were than she was. Judy, you mentioned that sometimes I can be intimidating because I'm a big guy. I don't think I intimidated Helen Hogg one little tiny bit. And she had a keen sense of both the public perception of astronomy and the history of the RASC. In 1980, uh, when she was nearing, you know, the end of her uh, illustrious life and career, she gave a talk at the Halifax uh, General Assembly talk was entitled 80 years of observing variable stars and globular cluster and there I was sitting in the audience and I said you won <clears throat> but no she uh, she did give a very good overview at the time anyway that's her in the center there uh, over at the left the second person on the left was our London Center president uh, national rep and eventually honorary president of the London Center that's Bill Whalow who was head of astronomy at Western U for many many years in fact I guess close to three decades really so in the second phase, the RAC was, the RAC's public face was often characterized by national publications. We had our observer's handbook. Everybody knows we've got a tremendous tradition there. The, the journal I already mentioned, the successes of the journal in uh, terms of being accepted by the professional astronomers as their preferred place to publish in Canada. We also had our annual report. The annual reports nowadays, of course, we look back at them as gold. Look back here, there's a page from the annual report of, that shows the meetings of the London Center in 1929. I mean, we do have London Center records, but it's nice to see things summarized and acknowledged at the national level. So, you know, this was a, a main function, I think, of what the RAC did in what I'm calling the second phase. One of the publications was a London Center member, H.R. Uh, Kingston, our founder, our honorary president for many years, and who, and our first London Center member to be a national president. He wrote a book called An Easy Pocket Guide for Beginners, which is uh, still available as a download from the Society website. You might think of it more as a uh, historical item today, but it's pretty neat to read it. In the 1970s, there was acknowledgement that maybe there would be an interest in sharing news from across the, across the society. So we, had a, so we started a national newsletter. 
And then more opportunities popped up. The 1980 saw the publication of the Beginner's Observing Guide by Leo Enright. And of course, Mary Lou Whitehorn. Mary Lou, welcome. Uh, you are here, you are listening. We had the, take on the initiative of producing the, the handbook for teachers known as Skyways. And I have a photo here of Rajiv Gupta. Rajiv is a Vancouver Center member and he started the, what we now call the Observer's Calendar. And Paul Gray, who's not with us today, but he uh, did message me this morning to say, to wish me well. And I thank Paul for doing that. Uh, Paul's been an editor more recently. I haven't heard if we've chosen a new editor for the Observer's Calendar, but all of you who've used the Observer's Calendar know what a great piece of fun that is and how it gives us a sense of national accomplishment, something to hang, our, hang on our walls, of course, that uh, relates us to the national society. I also wanna acknowledge, of course, that uh, by selling any of these items to non-members, we help pad our, our uh, income side of our budget. And really it did help balance the budget for many, many years. Now, I, I'm gonna say the third phase of the RAC started, again, I'm being kind of arbitrary with uh, folks like me, the so-called baby boomer generation. I think it's fair to say that uh, all of us were inspired by space exploration one way or another whether we seriously thought we were gonna go into space or not, well, that's another question. But anyway, uh, being youthful and with the, you know, the 60s, you know, do your own thing kind of uh, attitude, often uh, the, this, this group, this youthful group was a little bit disrespectful and that made for lots of fun. Maybe it made for some hard feelings. I don't, I won't, I won't say for sure, at least I won't say it publicly, but I, I know that I, I had a lot of fun doing things that I, I thought were uh, intended to call into question the authority of the establishment in those days. Is that putting it politely enough for everyone? Anyway, the um, annual meeting of the society became a big deal, the General Assembly, of course, and Halifax is hosted, if I'm not mistaken, three times, uh, or actually, no, it's four, isn't it? Because, you, well, whatever, three or four times. And uh, I know that when I started being active in the society in the mid-1970s, I made a conscious decision that the RESC was a great way to get to know Canada. And I made a, you know, pretty much a commitment that each year I would plan whatever time I had around the RESC's GA. And that's, uh, that, that's how I've seen, seen the country. I think it's a great way to do this. Um, Canada is a lovely country for a lot of reasons and astronomy is maybe the best of them, but it's certainly in the, in the club and we need to, we need to acknowledge that. And you know, there's always things to do at the national level. I know many folks here in London, I've often had conversations with folks who say, you know, why bother participating on the national level? I just think it's something great to do. I've, I've never tried to justify it other than to just say, I think it's wonderful. So you've got all these neat things to do like join national committees and um, go to meetings and so on. And of course the society across the country finds it easier to sponsor things like certificates and programs than it would be at an individual club level. Of course, the Montreal Center is well known for having started the Messier certificate back in the 50s. But what I'm saying is that as we moved into this third phase of the baby boomer generation taking over, it became easier to do things on a larger scale. I also want to acknowledge Rosemary Freeman, who was our executive secretary in the office in Toronto for many years. This is a photo of the outside of the Toronto office, which was um, the second piece of real estate the RASC uh, owned. And you know there was good and bad about being a land landowner or land uh, and landlord. Um, our capital increased thanks to the incre increase in real estate, but there's also responsibilities and other sorts of problems. So nowadays society um, uh, is um, in rented space. This is my friend David H. Levy, who's a past member of the Halifax Center, as well as Montreal Center and Kingston Center. And uh, once when David still had lots of hair, I noticed he was standing between me and the sun and I took this picture and called it the total eclipse of the sun by David H. Levy. You can see the solar corona there. I think it's either that or it's David's hair. And one of the many things that David has contributed to the society is that uh, he's made his basically his lifetime of logbook writing. All his observation records have been scanned and are on the national, on the society's website so that we can share uh, David's observations that way. And that became kind of a thing. So Leo Enright, who I've already mentioned, there's Leo down there. Leo and David were really great friends. And Leo passed away a few years ago. And Leo's logbooks are also available online. And, I've, and I just looked yesterday, there's two other 
our ASC members who po posted their logbooks there online. Um, one is long enough ago that I'm sure it's posthumous. I'm not sure if the other one is, but I think that's a terrific idea. And if computer technology keeps going the way it is, I think it's wonderful that we uh, are able to provide a lasting record of the RAC's activities in the world of astronomy and observing by doing that and making that available there. Well, all right, so now we're into the meat of the thing because you know this was my part of the RAC, the, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and into the 21st century. Uh, I'm among the past presidents, and I always think it's a great piece of tradition to uh, get together. Here you see, um, what is it, seven of the past presidents along with Rosemary after she had retired. And in fact, uh, Bonnie Bird sitting in the middle was our executive secretary after Rosemary. If I'm not mistaken, the 2008 General Assembly is when we paid our thanks to Bonnie and that because I think she retired that year, if I remember correctly. And so that's great fun. Now, of course, the General Assembly is already mentioned. I'm going to show a couple of pictures of what I, what I like to think of is that uh, we're combining the best features of youth and wisdom of age by, by in the phrase zaniness, zaniness and tradition. And I really, I've always kind of tried to honor that. Here you see the traditional group photo. Here you see the banquet at the 1979 General Assembly, which we hosted here in London. And of course, that was the first uh, semi-official song contest. We'd done some song singing at earlier GAs, but we actually made it into a competition at the 1979 General Assembly. And there you see at the far left, there's uh, Mike Flagel drinking a bottle of beer. I'm not sure if you're allowed to drink beer in the dorms at uh, Western U anymore, but that's the kind of fun we had in those days. And we got also started the tradition of having a human pyramid each year. The really hefty boys down the bottom, that's me next to, uh, I forget if that's Tim from Windsor or is it Dave Gallant in the middle? I see Gary Boyle and Pat Kelly and... Who else is in there? Scott, St uh, David Levy's there. Anyway, we always have fun doing this. I, I see Stan, and Stan, I think, was on the call, isn't he? Anyway, uh, pyramids are a great way to get together and, and actually prove that you're willing to hold up the society. So one of the most important things that I think happened in terms of honoring our history is the publication of Peter Broughton's book, Looking Up. I have my copy right here next to, next to me. Uh, I figured it would be a little cheap if I just took pictures nothing but pictures for looking up, uh, from looking up for this slideshow. So most of these slides are not from looking up, but some of them are. Um, that's a really great publication. And of course, it's available as PDF as well. Well, uh, at the 2019 General Assembly, again, I'm really only just including this because a few other past presidents of our recent generation managed to make it. I labeled them on the picture this time. Uh, Doug Hube's front, uh, jacket made it too difficult to type his name in front of him. So I put his name on Dave Lane. I figured no one in this call is gonna get Dave Lane mixed up with Doug Hube. So there we are. And so uh, I, again, it's just a question of respecting our tradition. But it was also important, I guess, in a way that we didn't anticipate because 2019 was the last time that we had an in-person event for the entire, entire society. So we've had to deal with that now. And as, as you probably know, uh, 2022 for the third time the GA will be uh, online and you can sign up for that right away. And it will be in, I guess, three weeks from now. Well, one of the biggest traditions of course is awards. And we've got uh, a, a handful of really well-known and well-respected awards. The gold medal was the uh, first of these awards started in 1906. It was given for an academic, as an academic prize to an astronomy student at University of Toronto. But uh, gradually, of course, with the society being national, it was recognized we wanted to do something a little different. So in 1986, there was a committee and we changed the gold medal into the Plaskett Medal, which honors a, a PhD thesis written anywhere in Canada uh, in astronomy. And it's chosen by the members of the Professional Society, which was formed back in the 1970s. The professional researchers decided they wanted to have their own society instead of being part of the RASC. So CASCA is the, uh, makes, the, makes the decision on who wins the Plaskett Medal but it's still considered a partnership with the RAC. Meanwhile, the idea of having a gold medal for the Toronto, University of Toronto's top student was indeed continued by the uh, Toronto Centre. The slide shows uh, Ian Halliday, a former past president. And in fact, I meant to look it up, but he may, he may be a gold medal winner himself, uh, giving the 2001 Plaskett Medal to London Centre's Peter Brown, who's a meteor researcher. Chan Medal is the second most important society medal, it's silver. 
and that kind of honors that tradition of gold, silver, bronze, and started in 1940 uh, to honor the Clarence Chant. And the picture that you see here is the only London Center uh, Chant Medal. This was awarded in 1942 to W.G. Colgrove for his work in making astronomical models and uh, teaching aids. And we got, we got this picture because we reached out to his family a few years ago, and it turned out they still had kept it, even passed away in the late 50s. And uh, we, we met his grandson and his granddaughter turns out to have been a student uh, at Western U. So we had them all come in at the Cronin for a nice little ceremony. So this is what the chant medal looks like. Of course, the service award will be familiar because many of, uh, many of, uh, many of us are on this call right now. There have been probably closer to 200 service medals by now. It started in 1959 because it was done in honor of uh, E.J.A. Kennedy. I never, I never met him, but he was um, secretary of the Society's Council for something like 25 years or something like that. And so when he retired, they struck the medal in his honor. So it could have been called the, the Kennedy Medal, but they just decided to make it more general, call it the Service Award. The picture is uh, six of the seven service awards, and a little bit of, they haven't changed much really. They look the same over time. These are the London Center members who've won the service award over the years. And then of course, there's other awards, which compared to the gold, the silver and the bronze medal, we might consider less significant, but they're still important in their own ways. The Simon Newcomb Award is one of your own. Halifax Center started the Simon Newcomb Award. And uh, it's a, an award for writing or communication in astronomy. Originally, you had to write an essay for that. Dave Chapman and I are both past winners in, in that, in that uh, regime. But then in 1998, they changed the rules. And now it's given for long-term contribution and achievement in writing about astronomy. So we have winners like uh, Terry Dickinson and uh, Dan Falk. Um, Dan, is, is Dan from Halifax? I forgot to reach out to him before this meeting but Dan's won the Simon Newcomb Award as well. The Chilton Prize was started by, um, in honor of uh, Ken Chilton, a member of the Hamilton Center who passed away uh, at a young age in the mid seventies. And it recognizes a significant astronomy project. One of the great thrills about being a national president is you get to hand out awards. This is me handing, out, handing the Chilton Prize to Attila Danko in 2005. Um, one of the problems, and, and now we have the KELAC Award. Now, let me, let me say a word or two about the KELAC Award. It honors um, public outreach. And there are, in fact, three KELAC Awards, one uh, from RASC, one from CASCA, and one from the Fédération d'Amateur Astronome de Québec, which is the French language group that uh, serves astronomy in the province of Quebec. And so it was decided to, uh, to give uh, a, an award for outreach and so three of us were, I, was, I represented RASC on that little ad hoc committee. And the decision was that it would probably be too difficult to try and coordinate all three societies. And somehow or other, it would break down if we tried to form just one award. So we agreed to each of the three societies would be able to give a KELAC award each year, so long as we stayed true to the spirit of it. And of course, that's exactly what has happened. So in 2013, our London Center member, Bob Duff, who's done an awful lot for outreach in the London area um, and still submits um, reports on outreach events in London, he was given the award, and that's Glenn Hawley, who was national president at the time. Another thing that the society does that I think is a wonderful little piece of fun is the honorary members. We have up to 15 honorary members, according to our rules, and the idea is to ask uh, professional research astronomers basically at the top of the field. In other words, the best, best research astronomers in various sub-branches of astronomy around the world are invited to be honorary members. This is a picture of Bart Bach. And the, the joke here is that we asked Bart, uh, there, was, there I was sitting at Bart Bach's house with my wife, Diane, and with David Levy, and we're having dinner together. And we asked Bart what the society gave him to um, as a memento or to commemorate the fact that he was an honorary member. And he pulled this uh, plaque off the wall. And the plaque is nothing more sophisticated than just a cloth crest with a little card below it saying that Bart Bach is a member. And the joke was, of course, that, you know, he deserved something much bigger, a statue or, you know, some great tremendous plaque or something. And all, all they gave him was this little crest. And so he pulled a long face and, and, uh, and, I, and I grabbed a photo of him pretending to be disappointed in what this RASC gave him to... Uh, 
count that he was an honorary, honorary member, but he was a wonderful person. And as an honorary member, we invited him in London to, to our Diamond Jubilee, and he gave uh, a wonderful talk about the history of the Milky Way uh, research in, in 1982. Well, now I'm going to just say a few words about where we're at today and where we're going the present day. I, I would like to suggest that the society is now in the fourth phase of its existence, that in, a fund, in very fundamental ways, we're different from the society, even just of, uh, you know, well, my society of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and the early 21st century. And mainly it was motivated by a change in the rules from the federal government. Uh, I call it the crackdown because it came from the Canada Revenue Agency. And also the Canada Not-for-Profit Corporations Act makes a certain stipulations that groups like ours have to follow. And they were, well, you know, nothing wrong with them, but they were certainly different enough that the society spent a few years, um, the, 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 the society presidents who followed me know about this because it was a lot of work for them. And so we had to basically restructure. And the current structure, it's a bit of a cartoon here, but I think it's correct to say that uh, our bylaw and our board of directors is now in charge of the society in a way that perhaps formerly the National Council was. And the National Council was voted on by the centers and uh, the national executive, the national president, vice presidents were voted on by the members. That's not the way it's done anymore. The society is now run by board of directors. The board of directors are elected by the society's members, but that does not give us access to the president or the other executive roles because those are chosen from the winners. In other words, once you're on the board of directors, then you're then that group is responsible for choosing the president and so on. We also have a more professional management with a professional executive director and um, and, and and more hired staff. Frankly, this is the uh, the current executive director is Phil Groth. That's him on the left, and Randy Atwood, who of course is well known to the members. He's had many roles in the society, including society president. And he was executive director for a long while as well. So this was the day Randy stepped down and uh, turned it over to Phil. And that was in the society's rented office space on, in the West End of Toronto. And we've now actually moved. Um, dur even during the COVID thing and everything like that, they were able to uh, make the move back to downtown. We're only just a few blocks from the more historic earlier uh, venues where the RAC's offices were were, and I've been to the new office. Uh, we just moved in basically at the first of this year. And the new office, it's still, it's still you know, that uh, they're still arranging the boxes of books and so on. But one of the key things that the rented space that we're in now is big enough to host the Dorner Telescope Museum. And this is really quite a wonderful thing that I think we'll have more and more appreciation of going forward. Uh, a, a fellow member from the Kitchener Center named Rudolf Dorner who passed away in March, donated a rather significant sum of money to help uh, maintain this museum of old telescopes and other artifacts and so on. And Randall Rosenfeld, who I didn't see on our list today, I, I did send him an invite to today's meeting, but Randall, who's a very whimsical, wonderful guy with a great brain and great attention to detail, he's the director and also the archivist. So it's uh, maybe a little hard to tell where we draw the line between telescopes and old archive items, but this is where it is right now. This picture I took when we were there in March. The green tube on the right is an artifact from London Center. It was built by a London Center member back in the 1930s. So we've been uh, able to pass that on to the Dorner Telescope Museum. And that basically brings us up to today. Uh, I, you know, one of the things about uh, Judy introducing me as being a, as having a great sense of humor is I didn't really have to be funny. I could be as serious as I wanted and people still end up laughing. I know that's the way it works. So uh, thank you very much. And I have, Judy mentioned, I've been a life member since the 1970s. My life membership has paid for itself many times over. And frankly, I hope my life membership never expires. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks so much, Peter. That was fabulous. It was a great overview of our history. And love I love those shadows, shot, shot Jews. <laughs> yes, you're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some things change, eh? And some things stay the same. <laughs> but you well, did ask me about like Erica, he was in Judy. trouble. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I said you did ask about the haircut, and there's the haircut I had. And then James said something too. I think he was teasing me too. Uh, I was saying that I think I think you look like you were in trouble. 
Oh, Rick, <laughs> Rick, thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah, I was in trouble. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. You bet. I started getting in trouble when I was that age. You bet. <laughs> and, and knowing you over the last, well, seven years of my existence within RASC, um, yes, I can agree to that statement. Look innocent, but a little disturber at times when it's appropriate to do so. <laughs> I uh, thank you so much for that. That was really intriguing. Um, what, uh, where we came from, and it's interesting to note that um, a lot of our history and important pieces of our RASC puzzle aren't all from Toronto. They are from various parts of the country. The contributions that have been made over the years, in terms of the science, in terms of um, contributions, in terms of a, what's what attendance and that sort of thing uh, at the society that it's, it's this wonderful woven fabric of, of everyone together. It's great. Because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that uh, unlike politics, we aren't getting um, what's the word I'm, dictated to by Toronto. It, um, our, our organization um, has the joy of having 30 centers that contribute to what RASC is and what RASC is becoming. And so, that is very valuable, and I'm glad you were able to show that. Any questions for Peter before we go on? Well, I have some things to say. I'm sure you would. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, this is Dave Chapman. Uh, Peter's, Peter's being very modest um, about his accomplishments. I, I won't go on about them, but I, I, I do want to point out that he mentioned he was a life member, but he's also one of the fellows of the RESC. And there's a few of those in attendance today. Uh, so he, you know, basically that's enough said. I mean, to become a fellow, you've had to make a, make a big contribution to the society. And Peter, even with his evil ways, has um, has done so. Um, I'd, al I'd also like to point out that... Uh, uh, more close to home, I'm, I'm also a fellow, but more close to home, uh, Peter uh, is one of the RESC asteroids. And I think, I was trying to keep track, uh, there's about, I think there's seven asteroids, six, at least six asteroids in attendance today for his talk. So, and, and, and I wanted to bring that up because Peter was the, Peter has had a strong interest in RESC asteroids for a long time. And uh, Peter... Uh, with others, uh, was the mastermind behind the latest um, uh, the latest run of RESC asteroids, which came out between, I guess, last September and I think most recently, maybe just last month. Uh, I, I've lost count again, Peter. Maybe you can remind me. It's 29 or something like that that have been named by the IAU in, in that period of time, all after... RESC suggestions, and so I wanted to point out that recent contribution and, and thank him publicly for taking care of that. Thanks, David. It's, uh, we like to acknowledge members uh, near and far when their accomplishments are many, and, and Peter certainly has many, so thank you for bringing those forward. Uh, Peter has an informal accomplishment that anyone that knows now at any sort of formal business meeting of the RESC, they always pause at the end because uh, for abstentions. Uh, and Peter was famous uh, during his National Council days to, to never, ever have a vote that was unanimous. If it appeared to be unanimous, he would always abstain. So we had to wait for that. Yeah. No, it was worse than that, Dave. I would actually vote against the motion to prevent it from being unanimous. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a philosophical point, but uh, I'm willing to take on anybody who wants to have an argument about that. <laughs> I was going to ask Peter. Um, I was down in London a few years ago, as you remember, and got to tour the Cronin Observatory, which... I believe is now the largest operational refractor in the country since uh, Science and Tech Museum tore down the Helen Sawyer Hogg Observatory. Do you know the name, the history of the name on the observatory? Sorry, which, which name, Rick? Cronin. 
Oh, sure, of course. Well, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I took a bunch of slides out of this presentation because I basically gave this presentation at London Center back in March. Hume Cronin was a Londoner, uh, a business person, a politician, and a military uh, um, leader in the rebellion of 1871 or something like that, I guess it was, uh, out, in the, out in the West, out in the Great Plains. Maybe you Westerners know what kind of rebellion that was. Anyway, he was a Londoner. And when he passed away in 1933 or 38 or something like that, uh, his widow um, decided to donate money to the university. And Kingston was able to persuade her to make it an observatory. And if you recognize it, Peter. Sorry, what? 1873. Was oh, yes, of course. The, you, you were there, right, James? That's when the Northwest Mounted Police were formed to yeah. put down the rebellion. So anyway, so if you recognize the name Hume Cronin, because, of course, there's a Hollywood actor uh, in, in our generation who was famous, and he is, in fact, the son of our Hume Cronin. He was born in London, so yeah. Very good. Excellent presentation, Peter. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Thank you all. It's a great privilege. Okay. Any other questions or comments for Peter? Well, it sounds like it's 100% abstention, Peter. <laughs> no, not quite. Oh, not quite. there we go. <laughs> uh, thanks, Peter, for giving so many good reasons for joining the RESC and once you're joined for getting more deeply involved. Like is that, was that a recruitment speech or what? Judy? Uh, it that was. Yeah. I mean, and if you, you look at the attendance at today's meeting, which is across the country, that just speaks uh, volumes to not only Peter's presence, but also to Kareem's and to the fact that our organization is multi-provincial. So it's across the country and this is fabulous. So, yeah. And look at the fun we're having folks just by participating. Honestly, Judy, if I can say it's one of the, one of the few pluses from COVID times is the fact that we actually have become a national organization and even a global presence in a global organization is we have members from all over the world now that are RASC either center affiliated or national members but they come into our meetings and it adds just so much to the dynamic. Uh, Peter comes to a bunch of our clubhouses and uh, it's just a joy to hear him and David kind of riff on the history in the early part of the clubhouses and just chat away with Carl and others. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and to your point, Karim, of international, three of our members, um, one from New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania and Massachusetts. So we've got members down the Eastern Seaboard that are joining our center and participating actively. So it, it truly has allowed us to expand our borders, literally. And I think it's only right that our next uh, in-person GA, maybe Lisa just hosts it at her home and we all go down there. I would suggest that. So yeah. Lisa, be prepared. <laughs> we'll be at the store. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear the sonic boom as Lisa ran the other way? <laughs> well, I was going to mention it's been a while since London Center hosted, but I don't want to open up that can of worms. Uh, 2015 or 16, Peter, was that? It was 2016, Cream, and, and we're, <laughs> we are not due yet. One of the thoughts, of course, was to host during our centennial, but uh, no, no, we put a squash on that pretty quick. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Well, I want to thank you again, Peter, for this. I truly appreciate you spending part of your Saturday with us.